Hello everybody, this is John Easton with Angler's Covey and thank you for joining us for another edition of Bug of the Month. Uh, it's May and we're going to actually be doing things a little bit different this month. So we will still be talking about bugs and fly patterns, stuff like that, but we're going to do a still water deep dive. So we're also going to be talking about rigging, uh, different fishing techniques, and even places to look for fish in still water. And as you've seen over the past couple of weeks, um, we've been talking a lot about still water. So this month is going to be a real big deep dive into still water fly fishing. Um, now to start, still water fly fishing is often intimidating to a lot of uh, fly fishers. And um, it's, it's a lot different than the rivers and streams that we fish in our area. Uh, it's a, definitely a breath of fresh air when we get to use 2 and 3x uh, terminal tackle and way bigger flies and even bigger rods. So it's a whole different game from everything that we're used to uh, fishing throughout the, the season. Now right here in our area, we have a lot of really good still water opportunities. Everything from the North Slope Lakes up on Pikes Peak to even some of the urban lakes in town uh, to the trophy trout fisheries up in South Park. Uh, today I'm joining you from Spinney Reservoir. Uh, Spinney's currently about 55% full, uh, so we're, we're right before that runoff and hopefully we get some more water coming into Spinney. So what we're going to start, we're going to kind of get into the nuts and the bolts of, of everything still water. So in still water fly fishing, I actually like to use a um, little bit bigger rods. My preferred rod for still water is a 10 foot seven weight uh, with a large or extra large arbor reel. Now this is going to allow me to really throw the wood on fish and, and be able to keep those fish's heads up when I'm fighting them, keep them out of the weeds, which we will experience later in the summer. Um, but really I can, I can throw a lot of muscle back onto the fish with a bigger rod. That 10 foot length is going to allow me to cast a little bit further as we progress through the season two and the fish start to move out uh, further into the lakes. Now you can certainly use your, your nine foot five weight that you have and that you use for all your river applications. Uh, however, in still water, you will see some deficiencies with that size rod. Now, having a longer rod is definitely probably the most important thing, uh, being able to keep a lot of leverage on those fish and being able to cast a little bit further. For fly lines, I like to use a variety of fly lines in still water fly fishing. The one I use most is probably just a weight forward floating line. Um, so you would get a weight forward floating line for whatever rod and reel uh, that you have. Um, and then you want to add some other stuff. So whether you get different reels or different spools for the same reel, um, I always recommend having an intermediate sink, uh, a one, two, and a three. Um, I really like the, the intermediate type one sink lines. Um, they're also known as hover lines. And the tip of the line will actually just sink a couple feet below the surface. So this is, this is a really good technique when I do something like stripping uh, midges or stripping different bugs under the water. And to be clear, it's not stripping uh, flies like you would a streamer, it's more or less crawling them. And the midge strip is, a, is a, definitely a very effective technique year round on still water. Now with this other rod, what I have on this rod is an intermediate one uh, sink tip and or a hover line. So what this line does is it only goes a foot or so below the surface. Now what I can do is I can have an extra long leader here um, and I do just straight coming straight off my fly line. I probably have a 20 foot leader and then my tags. Um, I can tie tags off of my leader here and then my flies. And when you're doing this system, you always want to put the heaviest fly on the bottom. You can put up to three flies on this rig. Um, most of the time I like to fish two and I'll fish them. It's kind of some different bugs here. So um, this time of year, uh, definitely going kind of a woolly bugger or a leech on the very bottom with some weight to it. And then up above it, I can do some different patterns like um, chronomids, which are hatching like crazy today, scuds, uh, even another leech. When the calabatas start going, I can start adding those and damsels, things like that. So this is a really good um, way to rig and fish in still water. It's going to be a little bit more um, exciting than just staring at an indicator, but um, it's definitely a harder technique to master. So here's a little diagram of the midge strip rig.
Next, we'll kind of touch on our terminal tackle. So sometimes when you're in the fly shop, you see these 12 foot leaders that are zero, one, two, three X. Um, well, those are definitely good for still water. Um, I do like the 12 foot leaders. They give me a lot of, uh, a lot of room for adjustments. Now, this time of year in May, the fish are really close to shore. So we're not having to fish really deep. As you progress through the, the season, uh, the fish will go deeper and deeper and you will need to have a lot more variance in your leader and your tippet system so you can reach those fish. Now, just like rivers, depth, and weight are very important when we're talking about nymphing in still water venues. Um, and then of course, some good old Beastie 3X or even 2X tippet. So we're gonna keep this stuff really heavy. Uh, the fish aren't tippet shy uh, like they would be on a, on a tailwater. Um, go big, it will serve you better. Uh, and now when we're talking about just static nymphing in a lake, a lot of times it's set up just like you would in a river. Um, you can have your tapered leader with your tippet attached to it and then your fly system going down from there. Um, you see these big indicators in a fly shop? These are perfect for still water. And you want to think that something far away from you, you want to be able to see. So these brighter colored um, bobber type indicators are great. Another one of my favorites is the slip indicator. Now the slip indicator is a perfect uh, little tool for fishing a lot of varied depths in still water and actually getting very deep. So the slip indicator uh, is a really cool little uh, tool that you should add to your, your nymph setup when you are still water nymphing. Now, to explain this slip indicator a, a little more in detail, I'm just going to take a piece of line here and this is going to um, represent my leader. So the thing with this is what I do is I put this indicator on before um, I start tying more tippet on or flies or anything. This just floats on my leader. You can see it moving back and forth there. Now, what I can do here is when I get this to a position where I want to fix fish a fixed depth, um, all I'm going to do is actually pull the little post out of that slip indicator. And I'm going to put just a tiny little loop in the line. And then I'm going to push this in, into the cork and this will allow it to be fixed. The benefit of this is if I have a really long leader and if you've probably been in this position before where you're, you reel up all your fly line and you're going to net a fish and there's not enough room, right? So if you're thinking you have a 12 foot leader and then three to five feet of tippet, that's going to make it really hard, a really hard reach to be able to net that fish. That's where these slip indicators come in. So it's, I have the little loop there and the leader is actually punched into um, the foam of this indicator. Now what happens when this system experiences uh, pressure, that indicator actually lets go. So I'll just pop it here and then you can see it it can move freely. So the indicator will slide clear down to where your tippet starts or wherever you have uh, an intersection of line and that'll shorten everything up so you'll be able to net that fish a lot easier. Going over some fly patterns. Now, fly patterns in still water, it's definitely another breath of fresh air. Um, it's gonna be pretty simple. At the beginning of the year, I focus on a lot of egg patterns, um, scuds, leeches, and very small midges or chronomids. Um, there's not much available in the lake after the ice comes off, uh, and everything that is available is gonna be really close to shore. So again, the fish are gonna be bucked into shore really close because that's where all the food is. Uh, as we progress through the, the year and it starts getting warmer, the substrate starts to grow, those fish are gonna start spreading out more and there's actually gonna be more bugs available. Now, today, it's pretty interesting. I get up here to Spinney and there are, the, I'm starting to see the buff, buffalo chronomids. So it's a bigger midge, uh, think size 14. Um, it's kind of hard to believe that a midge would be about that size, but we're starting to see those. Now, what I do this time of year is I start to add some of those bigger uh, chronomids into my, my fly selection while I'm fishing, right? So right now I could go anywhere from size 20 to probably 14. Um, and on any given day, the fish will pick on 
a certain size pattern. So you want to be paying attention to that and you want to really do a, a wide variance of different size chronomids especially. Now we start going into June, we're going to start to see the Calabatus show up. Um, and just like their mayfly friends on the rivers, um, the fish go nuts for this lake mayfly. Um, it looks just like our river mayflies, our trichos, our PMDs, or our blue wing olives, uh, except it's way bigger. So it still has that sailboat wing and it still flies just like a mayfly. And the fish go equally bonkers for them. Another thing that we're going to start to see as we get into the summer are the damselflies. And the damselflies are another really fun hatch to fish. Um, damsels are generally in very shallow water. And this gives us an ability as anglers to do a lot of sight fishing, especially if you have a boat or a kayak, you can get into these shallower bays and you'll see fish cruising and picking off these damselflies. Um, and every once in a while, the fish will eat that adult damsel on the top of the water. Now, a lot of people get a damselfly and a dragonfly confused. A very easy way to tell the difference between the two is a damselfly is very slender. A dragonfly has a very bulbous thorax, a damselfly does not. So they look almost the same, the green and the, and the, and the blue as the adults, but you can tell by their body shape, uh, whether it's a, a, um, a damselfly or a dragonfly. Now, when we are in the middle of the summer, there can, it, it can be really hard to decipher what those fish are eating, unless you're in uh, one of those calabatus hatches or a damsel hatch, something like that. Um, but that's just like our rivers, it, it can be really hard to decipher. Um, a lot of times, you know, leeches, scuds, chronomids, calabatus, damsels, um, even snails, those are all, all flies that I really pay attention to through, to through most of the still water season. Um, and it may take you a little bit to each day to go through those patterns just like you would on the river. But I can tell you when they are on a pattern, they're on it uh, and they're gonna be on it all over the lake and usually sustained for at least several days. Now kind of going back to the calabatus and the damsels, an important fact about these bugs when they are in their premature stages is that they're excellent swimmers. Um, so these these bugs are actually swimming around and they're trying to get up to the, to the top of the water to hatch. So um, when we go back to talking about our mid stripping technique, that's why that's so exp effective. Um, if, if you can be on the still water when there's damselflies and calabatus, um, putting those two fly patterns on that stripping rig, it's going to be very deadly. Another very important fact about still water fly fishing is you want to be able to have a little bit of wind. Now that seems counterintuitive there for sure, but very calm days on, on still water, they're great for recreational kayaking, doing all that kind of stuff. But in terms of fishing, it definitely hurts the fishing. We want a little bit of chop on, on these lakes. That's going to make the fish feel a lot more comfortable. And it's actually going to help our flies look like they're supposed to be there. Uh, and what I mean by that is take a, a chronomid, for instance, a pupating chronomid, uh, takes a very long time to get to the top of the, the, the surface to actually hatch. So in a sense, what this pupating stage of this chronomid does is it'll swim up, it will drop, it will swim up, it will drop, it will swim up, and it will drop. And this process can be sometimes a day or even longer before that bug makes it to the top and actually hatches. Now, if you think about uh, an indicator system, so you have a, your indicator and then your leader, tip it, and then maybe a chronomid, right? And it's floating out there with chop, it's bobbing up and down. So it's actually making that chronomid look like exactly how it does in the wild. Um, very effective f way to fish chronomids. But you want, it, you want a little bit of chop on that lake. It's notorious uh, glass days are the hardest days. Um, and again, there's a fine line there, and especially up here in South Park where we can get too much wind. They wanna look for about those 10 to 15 mile an hour winds. Those are about perfect for still water fly fishing. In all, still water fly fishing can be pretty simple. Um, now, 
one of the most intimidating things for, for a lot of anglers is where to fish on the lake. Um, so what I'm actually going to look for is I'm going to look for depth changes. I'm going to look for any sort of weeds or structure, um, any, any place like that in the lake where fish can congregate. Shorelines are very good too. When I'm in a water a type of watercraft, a kayak or a boat, I like to parallel fish the shoreline. So here's the shoreline and here's me and I like to fish this way. Uh, sometimes an effective technique is to fish back towards the shore as well. Now you can do this with streamers, your mid stripping rig, or just hanging bugs under an indicator. And let's talk streamers. Um, of course streamers can be fished year round in st still water. Um, in still water, I like to have some sort of sink line or at least a sink tip line so I can get my flies down. Now, um, I always have a streamer rod with me uh, every single day I'm on still water. Uh, this could be a, a very effective way to, to catch fish in still water and it can also be a way to get yourself really hooked on streamer fishing. Uh, the streamer fishing in still water in my opinion is a lot more rapid than it is on some of our technical tailwaters. Um, so you want to definitely have some streamers with you on your still water adventures. Now let's talk watercraft. One of the most popular modes of fly fishing in a lake is the float tube or the pontoon boat. Now these are certainly viable options. Uh, they're economical, they're easy to transport, um, extremely portable, right? So when you come up to these lakes, you'll see a lot of float tubes and pontoon boats up here. And again, that's certainly an option. Uh, to step up from that, you're going to go into a kayak. Now kayaks are really portable as well, but you're going to be able to get around the lake a lot easier. The one downfall of a float tube is you go nowhere fast. So if you need to change spots or you get caught in the wind, it can be a little cumbersome in a float tube. A kayak's going to be a little bit more efficient. Um, we have a slew of different fishing kayaks here at the shop, and if you've never been in one, you definitely want to come rent one and, and go still water fly fishing with it. And of course, motorized boats. Now you want to check your regulations of whatever lake you're planning to go to and make sure that motorized boats are allowed there and be sure to follow all of the, the rules uh, surrounding that. Um, modes of watercraft are definitely recommended as we progress out of May and into the summer months. Uh, those fish will start moving deeper or further into the lake and deeper in the lake um, and you do need a watercraft to get there. Um, that's not saying you, you can't catch fish from the shore, but the, the majority of the fish are not going to be uh, bucked up on those shorelines any longer. Diving back into where we will try to find fish in still water, a lot of times it's just a guessing game. Now, we can we can sight a lot of fish sometimes and see fish working or see fish rising and that will kind of give us an indicator of where there's some fish may be. The thing to understand about fish and how they feed in a lake is they almost travel in pods. So um, you'll get a lot of action. You'll get almost uh, takes one after another and then you'll have a gap of time where nothing happens and then it'll pick back up and then nothing happens. And this is really indicative of those kind of traveling pods of fish working around the lake fishing. Uh, fish aren't going to just be in one spot. Um, and again, that's kind of the benefit of having some sort of watercraft so you can move around and, and reach those fish. I will say the one thing that you want to look out for too are afternoon thunderstorms uh, up here on Stillwater. Um, they can come out of nowhere and lightning can be a very scary deal up here. So. Always look to the west. If you start seeing those clouds um, start building and getting dark, it might be a good time to, to think about wrapping it up. Now, as a general rule, um, most of your still water fly fishing should be done in the morning because of those afternoon thunderstorms. Now, you can almost set your watch to it in the summertime where it will be beautiful still water conditions clear up to about noon or one o'clock, then a storm rolls in does its thing and then it clears back up. So that back end of the day too, if you wanna um, kind of wait and let that thunderstorm pass can also be very good. And finally, we do realize that still water fly fishing can be a little intimidating and out of most people's comfort zone. So we wanna invite you guys to call the shop, 
come by, send us a message, drop a comment if you have any questions at all. We want to be there to help you through this still water fly fishing journey. And I will say that if you really want to flatten the curve and learn still water fly fishing, hire one of our professional guides. Uh, we have a lot of guides that are very passionate about still water, and that is the fastest way and the easiest way to get into still water fly fishing. Please join us next week where we're going to be tying up some of our favorite still water patterns. Until next time, thanks for joining us. <laughs>